Welcome to those of you who are currently joining. It's great that you've managed to make time in your day to be with us for another session in our Summer 2022 Bite-Sized Corrosion series. In our current series, we've been talking about some of the hidden dangers associated with cathodic protection. And yesterday, we explored some of those hidden dangers which are associated when we have too much cathodic protection in the presence of AC. Now today, I'd like us to continue this conversation about some of the risks of having too much cathodic protection by exploring the impact of that too much cathodic protection on the external coating of our buried pipeline. So welcome back to Neil. We really do appreciate your taking time out of your Kruger Park experience and joining us today. And I'm gonna guess that this morning's game drive highlight was elephants, because that's always my highlight. <laughs> no, I'm afraid you're wrong. Um, it was actually hyenas. Oh, it is incredibly However. cute. <laughs> <laughs> and, and very different and a far cry from our discussion of the risks of turning up cathodic protection. Neil, we chatted very briefly yesterday that there is a concern when we have cathodic protection that is too high or too negative in the presence of our coatings. Let's start with the definition of negative, shall we? The formal definition of the, the upper limit of cathodic protection, upper in magnitude, is minus 1200 millivolts with respect to a copper sulfate electrode. And that is a what we call polarized potential. And you'll find that in the ISO 15589-1 standard, which is the standard that we use generally here in South Africa. And in fact, it's used worldwide. And that value of minus 1200 is recognized pretty universally around the world as the upper limit. Some people will split hairs and say, no, it's 1150. Um, others will say, no, you can go a bit more than 1200. But the standard, the value in the standard is minus 1200. So that is our upper limit. And I know we're going to have lots of people jumping up and down and saying, oh, but my pipeline is running at minus five volts. Well, we're going to come to that a little bit later on in the discussion. So maybe you'd like to expand a bit on why 1200 is this upper limit. Well, I think we need to even take a step further back than that, Neil, and go back to the classroom and have a brief chemistry lesson. And let's go back to our basic corrosion cell, where we need to have our anode and our cathode. They're connected electrically, in the case of our pipeline, through the pipe material itself and in a common electrolyte. And it's really what's happening at the cathode, which is of importance in this discussion, because we need to remember that our pipeline is now the cathode. So disregard what's happening at the anode, and let's just focus at our cathode. And we mustn't forget that the mechanism of corrosion is this electrochemical interaction at play. And it's the chemical bit that people don't really like. A lot of people have horrible memories of, or even nightmares of chemistry at school, but it's really quite simple. And what's happening is that through the corrosion reaction, we have the source of electrons and they have to go somewhere. And at the cathode, they combine through our electrolyte with one of two media. They can either combine with a hydrogen ion, that's that really tiny little hydrogen ion. And when they combine with that, they form hydrogen and hydrogen exists as hydrogen gas. So that's the one thing that can form at the cathode. And the other thing that can form at the cathode is that those electrons can be sucked up as it were by oxygen. Remember in our soil or in water, we've got water present and there's another sort of chemical reaction that's happening in the background. But instead of just being sucked up by the oxygen, it has to be used in some format and it forms the hydroxyl ion. And it's that formation of the hydroxide ion which creates this really high pH environment. So the OH minus is similar to what you'd find in sodium hydroxide, and that's a designator of, the, of a high pH. And so the high pH is the, is the thing that we are uh, probably going to focus much of our discussion around today. And those pHs can go 
fairly high. Neil, what would you say about 10, maybe higher? Well, yeah, no, you can even get up to 12. That will burn your skin and it actually can interfere with the bond between the coating and the steel substrate. So it doesn't cause corrosion at this level, but it interferes then with the adhesion of the coating to the substrate. Uh, in the extreme case of hydrogen formation, and that minus 1200 millivolt value is related to what is called the hydrogen over voltage potential which is the potential beyond which you can generate hydrogen, but any cathodic reaction will generate hydroxide. And the minus 1200 is when you actually start then to generate hydrogen. And in some of the testing that we do, which we're going to talk about in a moment, you can actually see the hydrogen bubbles coming off the test specimen. If I can just quickly comment uh, before we move on from that, because that's that's very valid, but just some people struggle with the concept of acid and base or acid and alkali. And so just to into your home and, and practical environment, something acid, lemon juice, vinegar, and then your concentrated pool acids and so on. A, a basic solution or an alkali solution is something like soap, ammonia, and drain cleaner, sodium hydroxide that you would, caustic soda that you would put down the drain. Those are all hydroxides uh, by nature. So when we feel it, we feel it sort of in a soapy sense, but in these very high pHs, pH 10, 11, 12, you can really burn yourself with those hydroxides. And if it burns us, it can damage the coating. And as Neil says, can, can affect the adhesion and any hydrogen that's generated can obviously also damage the coating. There you go, Neil. There's a story behind this photograph, I'm certain. So this is a photograph of an epoxy system where the cathodic protection potentials were uncontrolled and have, has resulted in blistering of the coating. And this is a good indication of a, a situation where you have excessive cathodic protection is this coating damage that you see either in the form of blistering and eventually these blisters may well break and expose the underlying steel. When that happens, you're then faced with a, a vicious circle because you now need to again, increase the cathodic protection levels to cope with the increased area of steel that has been exposed. And so you turn up the wick on the cathodic protection that causes more desponding, causes more current, causes more CP. And so it goes around and around and around. And you eventually land up with having blown off the coating. So I think that and, highlights the criticality that the coating that is used in conjunction with cathodic protection has to be formulated in a specific way so that it is able to withstand these high pH environments. For sure, the, the actual formulation of the coating is critical in terms of the type of coating and then also its a correct application. And we have seen in many situations where a coating which has, for example, passed a what we call a pre-qualification test. In other words, the coating itself is physically compatible and chemically compatible with cathodic protection, but it's not applied correctly, either through poor surface preparation or overcoating times, or contamination, or poor mix ratios, or inadequate curing, all sorts of things like that, that that coating then does not perform. And one of the things that we then do on a regular basis is called a cathodic desponding test. And here you can see a graphic illustration of a cathodic desponding test. There are many different variants of this test. In the test, we have sodium chloride solution, like salt water, in other words, in a little cylinder that is glued onto this coated surface. There will be a deliberate defect made in the coating, and we polarize this steel plate negative with respect to the solution to a value that is in excess of that hydrogen over voltage potential. And it is done deliberately because we want to see how just how resistant the coating is to the effects of cathodic protection. And so it is affected by both the hydroxide formation 
and the physical disbonding effect of hydrogen gas formation on the surface. And that hydrogen gas formation occurs initially just on the exposed steel itself. As the coating starts to disbond due to the effect of the hydroxide, then you start getting hydrogen formed in underneath the coating as well. And it actually physically blows the coating off. And I think we said once before that if you've got a very poor coating in an immersion situation, cathodic protection is a very, very effective paint stripper. <laughs> but it doesn't always do that. Just before we, we look at these pictures from a cathodic desponding or various cathodic desponding tests, I think it's just worth saying there's quite a lot of confusion about CD tests in and of themselves. Which one do you choose? And there are many, many variants, uh, some at higher temperatures than others, some at different salt concentrations. And several of them have been designed for specific types of coatings. So just broadly saying, please do a CD test. It's important to make sure that the cathodic despondent test is appropriate for the coating that you're wanting to test. Mm. It, it's not equally applicable necessarily to every coating available on the market. A lot of these tests are um, high temperature tests. If you're not running a high temperature pipeline, then you don't need to do a high temperature test. Also, if you're in a production situation, you don't want a test that takes 30 days to get a result. You want a result the following day. So there, there are a number of different tests for different purposes. But what is interesting, in spite of the difference in detail, a lot of the tests have very, very similar Indeed. results. Indeed. And there's been a lot of very good work done recently, and a relatively new standard has come out from NACE. I don't remember the, the number offhand, where there is effectively a, what you can almost call a standard CD test that takes all the parameters from all the different uh, tests that have been developed around the world, combines them all into a single test methodology that can be applied to everything. I think we'll have to get hold of that number and, and perhaps we can incorporate it with the recording when we, when we put that up. We will but do. I've just got a couple of photographs here which indicate the variability that we can see in this testing. So this first photograph is of a fusion bonded epoxy coating which was um, correctly applied the right in the middle of this photograph you can see the little circle which was the original defect that was cut into the coating and this uh, test result is zero zero cathodic desponding under standard test conditions and that of course is the ultimate mm. that one is looking for there are very few coatings that can actually give you this. Here is an example of a polyethylene coating applied to steel. You can see the blast profile of the steel, and you can see this bright ring in the middle here. That is the area of loss of adhesion of the coating itself. And the tests require that this loss of adhesion under these very, bear in mind these tests are very harsh. They are far beyond the normal operating conditions, which is why they are called accelerated tests. And the test method says that for a coating to pass the test, the extent of this bonding has to be less than a certain limit. And we've often seen where this polyethylene coating itself is an accepted pipeline coating. Put it on wrong and it comes off in sheets. So it's not the material itself that is necessarily the problem. Here is an interesting situation that occurred where the pipe that was being used on a project was actually stock pipe that was pulled out from a store. And it, the stock pipe was kept with a coating applied, and they merely applied a tape wrapping, in this case, over the top of the coated pipe. And in the cathodic disbonding test, it actually stripped the tape wrapping completely off the pipe. So the big danger in a situation like this is that if you've got a small defect in the coating and you land up with moisture getting in underneath the coating in the presence of cathodic protection, 
protection, it disbonds, and then you have a problem of shielding in that the cathodic protection cannot penetrate through this plastic tape. And you can get under film corrosion taking place in spite of there being cathodic protection applied to the pipe. And this has happened in one or two occasions in, in South Africa. It actually happened quite a lot internationally. I remember talking to one of the service providers who does a lot of intelligent pigging of pipelines. And they reckoned that one of the major sources of metal loss on pipelines was under film corrosion due to cathodic disbondment. I think that that just goes back, as you've mentioned several times already, to the coating application. And I, th I think in there we've got a, a topic for our next series uh, at Bite Size Corrosion in February next year, and we'll talk a bit more about coatings. And Neil, just in that, the amount of current that we applying on our pipelines now is becoming harder to control because we've got such fancy coatings, and that's also causing its own suite of problems. If you take the bitumen coatings that were extensively used up until, say, the 60s or 70s, the typical coating current requirement was in the order of 250 microamps a square meter average. We're not, not, we're not talking about those very high densities we, we were talking about yesterday. Just to put that into perspective, a five kilometers of a 600 diameter pipe, that's a two foot diameter pipe, would require about two and a half amps of cathodic protection current. You take that same pipe and you put on one of the modern coatings like polyethylene or polymer modified bitumen, Richard polyurethane, any of those. And all of a sudden you now have a current requirement of three milliamps for that same piece of pipe. Now, if you take the theoretical cathodic protection calculations, you think, oh, that's great. I can protect lots and lots of pipe from a single point. The problem now is that if you're only supplying three milliamps to five kilometers of pipe and you've got a rectifier every 50 kilometers, you get a point of damage some distance from the rectifier. At that point of damage, you need a high current density. Mm. How are you going to get that current to that point? The temptation is to, well, turn up the rectifier. You turn up the rectifier because of a very good insulation value of the coatings, you find that the potentials at the drain point are then unacceptably high. And so control of the, of the CP system in terms of keeping the pipe under cathodic protection becomes more tricky. Now, just in line with that, we've just mentioned that if we have exceedingly high potentials, we can cause cathodic disbondment and we want to keep our, our cathodic protection in the desired range, which is minus 850, minus 950 to minus 1200 or whichever number we're going to take. So what are some of these ways that we can keep this control? Perhaps the best way is to incorporate coupons into the uh, monitoring system. So wherever you have a test point, you have a coupon. And that enables you to get a far better picture of the pipeline operations. In terms of the dial of cathodic protection, we mentioned it yesterday, I believe, little and often. In other words, use smaller rectifiers and put them more frequently. That, of course, has its own challenges, as we've spoken about already in terms of theft and vandalism and availability of, of power and stuff like that. And then, but what is coming out now is that we're going back to the future. <laughs> when I first started in the, in the industry, sacrificial anode systems were common and they were applied to hotspots on pipelines. And we're now, because of the, the vast improvement in the coatings, we are able to employ sacrificial anode systems with long operating lives and which can then um, provide you with a say a 30 year operating life uh, without having to worry about power supplies you can 
you can deliberately make it out of sight, out of mind, because we know where it is thanks to things like GPS, GPS. Yep. coordination. I think that, that that's probably quite practical, but that does not negate the necessity for confirming that your coating will withstand cathodic protection. So although we can control the potentials, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that that's not going to help if the coating in, its, in and of itself does not withstand the uh, impact of cathodic protection, those high pH mm -hmm. values and the possibility of hydrogen evolution. Yeah, the, the one thing that we cannot control is the high negatives associated with interference, particularly interference from the railways. And in terms of actually quantifying that value, we need to, again, use more sophisticated, maybe as a, a word to use, means of monitoring, because in cathodic protection, you may remember from some of our previous discussions, we talk about the value of off potentials and on potentials and IR factors in cathodic protection. The IR factor is very, very important. I know that one of the pipeline operators about oh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago started using coupons to check what their actual potentials were because their on potentials at, with, with, with um, reference electrodes at grade level were showing minus five, minus eight volts due to, to traction interference. And they were finding that their systems were actually operating very uh, safely at values in the range of minus one to minus 1.2 at the pipe. So the use of, of strategically placed coupons and correctly designed coupons is um, essential in terms of monitoring our uh, systems accurately. Absolutely, Neil. And, and I think that last comment about careful design of, of the equipment that we're installing is also key. As things progress, so there are changes, improvements in coupons, in stationary reference electrodes, in remote monitoring infrastructure, and all of those can be used effectively, but they need to be appropriately designed for the situation at hand. And uh, cons taking into account some of the local challenges as well. One of the, the aspects of that is that the straight current situation in particular, and I know we're going off topic slightly, but it, it's relevant. If you put straight current control in the wrong place, firstly, it won't control the straight current discharge, which allows corrosion. Secondly, it will promote high negative potentials. So uh, your straight current mitigation design is critical in terms of preventing overprotection and, and coating damage. Well, Neil, I think actually there's a lot more to this discussion than what you've started right now. So I'm going to ask you to hold that thought, as it were, uh, exactly that uh, interference currents also are a source of a hidden danger within the cathodic protection consideration. So I think let's hold that over and talk about that next week, if we may, when you will be back from the bush and uh, we can delve into the risks associated with interference and with continuity. I know sometimes you like to refer to that as being pipeline immunodeficiency. So would you be willing to join us then? Yeah, sure. Excellent. Thank you to Neil for taking time out from his escape into the bush for chatting with us today. And I hope that you found today's conversation about the risk to coatings from too much cathodic protection has been in informative and perhaps given you a different perspective with your own cathodic protection systems. So I really do thank you for joining us and hope that you can join us again on Tuesday next week. And we will be looking at some of the risks associated with interference and continuity in terms of our cathodic protection. So have a re great rest of the week and we'll see you next week. Thanks everyone. Cheers.